good evening. Well, now, it is definitely time for Tales and Cocktails. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's see if we can get this clear. Tonight, I want to read a story by Andy Logan. Now, this was Isabel Ann Logan, born in Cleveland in 1920, grew up in Ohio and North Carolina. She attended Swarthmore College, where she wrote fiction and started a life of letters. She won an O. Henry Award in 1941 for her first published short story, The Visit. And it's The Visit that I want to read to you tonight. So here we go. <clears throat> Tales and Cocktails. The Visit by Andy Logan. Ned's people live there, said Jane, suddenly lifting her hand from the wheel and waving wildly at two figures moving about one of the fields they passed. It's a big farm. I don't know anybody who's got more land or who's better thought of around here than Mr. Cleef. Really? said Dan. He crooked his elbow in the air and groped about in his pocket for cigarettes. Have one? Oh, no. She looked at him quickly and then turned away. He liked the look of her hands as they drove. They were small and brown and full of strength. Funny, he thought. She used to smoke. Did you have an interesting time in China? Asked Jane politely. You might call it that, thought Dan. His best friend had had his head blown off. And one day when he came home from a walk around the block, his trouser cuffs were reddish brown around the edges. He remembered sending the suit to the cleaners. Rather interesting, he said. You're very nice to let me spend the night like this. Don't be silly, said Jane, slowing up to let a hen run squawking to the other side of the road. There was no sense in your making that long trip down from New York just for a couple of hours. We've got loads of room. They were quiet for a while, driving through the autumn sunshine past a church and some gray farmhouses and a big raw brick school building, which Jane proudly called to his attention. The counties had to work hard for that, she said. Ned's father made speeches and Ned too, and finally we got it. It's only been finished since last August. Dan had forgotten that there were things like schools which were important and which people fought for and took pride in. He looked back at the ugly building with its red clay front yard. Probably Jane belonged to the Parents Association. He imagined her presiding at meetings. I think Mrs. Thatcher is quite right. I think the third grade room needs curtains very badly. Are the children, how old are they now, Jane? She glanced at him briefly, disapproval hovering around her mouth. Margaret was seven in July, Dan, and Hugh will be six next March. Oh, he had thought of them as older. He had thought of them, he realized suddenly, somewhere between 10 and 12, with long brown legs and old faces. He seemed a bit to have been away so long. You never call them Maggie and the General anymore? He asked after a moment. Oh no, said Jane, just Hugh and Margaret. Ned doesn't care much for nicknames she added as she turned into the driveway. The low bulk of the house lay awkwardly among the brown autumn leaves, like a thin sleeping hound. It was an undistinguished old place, but Dan saw nothing pathetic about it, as he had half expected. I wouldn't be ashamed to point it out to anyone, he thought. And he had a sudden picture of himself driving along with a car full of men in top hats and saying casually, oh, by the way, that white house there is where my wife and children live. My former life, I mean, he would have to add, 
and that would be awkward. He was glad it was only a silly idea. After Jane had taken him upstairs and he had set his bag and the presents for the children on the floor by the bed and washed his hands in the dark bathroom, Dan went out into the garden where his son and daughter were playing and was formally introduced to them. Their clothes were rather nicer now, he suspected, than every day. There was something odd about a little boy playing around a farm farmyard garden in pleated linen. I'd put you in khaki shorts if you were mine, thought Dan, and then stopped suddenly, because it was such a strange thing to say. After a while, Jane went back into the house to see about supper, and the two children stood there before him in the late afternoon sun, a little girl with bows in her hair and a thin-nosed boy, and they kicked the garden dirt with their shining shoes and called him Father, but there was no conviction in their voices. Do you go to school? he asked them politely. I do, said Margaret, but Hugh's too little. You have to be six. He tried to tell them about China and Spain and Ethiopia, but they were too young to be very interested. They showed him their playhouse ostentatiously and as if it had been suggested beforehand. Did you come on a boat? Margaret wanted to know, and he told them about that for a while. But soon they were making little bored jabs at each other and quarreling sharply. He stood watching them uncomfortably, like a stage father who couldn't remember his lines. Are you really our papa? Hugh asked him when the dinner bell had rung at last and they were hurrying up the walk towards the house. Of course, said Dan, but he had a quick guilty feeling that he was lying. It was just before dinner that Dan met Jane's husband. As he climbed up the steps to the back porch, he saw Ned and Jane standing there together talking in low voices. Jane was running the dark opal ring up and down her finger, and Dan knew she was upset about something. Ned stood beside her and smiled quietly at Dan. He was in overalls. Dan saw the way the children were dressed and how careful they had been in the garden about how they played and where they sat. He remembered them wiping off their shoes with light fingers before coming up for dinner. He understood why Jane's face was flushed. She had wanted them to see them all at their best, and here was Ned in dirty, manure-green overalls. How do you do, said Ned. I'm Ned Cleath. Glad to have you here. There was no embarrassment in his face as he looked at Dan, or in his large hand as he shook Dan's strongly. Sorry I'm dressed this way, but my prize mare just foaled, and I had to see to her. Dan saw that the tip of the man's red nose was peeling a little. He smiled back uneasily. The children, who had been standing shyly in the background, ran forward now and threw their arms around Ned, jerking at his sleeves and grabbing his knees and looking up at him happily. Is the big colt Ned? Is black Ned? How soon can I ride it? Ever? Maybe? We'd have come down to see it, Ned, if you said Jane. Come, let me wash your face. Dinner was good, although the hired girl served it awkwardly and a little resentfully. Dan suspected that on ordinary evenings she sat down to eat with the family. He ate briskly as the others did and tried to be intelligent about seed and threshing and the breeding of cattle. The children's eyes were big and watchful. Once Jane broke in sharply, let's not talk about farming all the time, Ned. She turned her spoon over and over on the table as she spoke. She didn't look at either of them. Okay, honey, 
and Ned smacked Hugh's hand lightly as it darted forth for a second chicken leg. Wait till you ask, son. You know, he said to Dan, we had more trouble getting that child to eat for a while. And then all at once, about a year ago, he turned hollow to his toes. Awfully funny thing. Ned reached over and pulled the little boy's hair playfully. Margaret, said Jane, please don't dunk your bread. But Ned does, mother. Say, said Ned, struggling up from the table a little later and stretching his arms in the air, I'll put the kids to bed now if you two have some business you want to talk over. Take him out and show him your garden, Jane. He grinned at Dan. Here, kiss your dad good night, kids. Good night, dad. Good night, dad. And they pecked Dan lightly on the chin. He felt foolish and thwarted as he took a walk around the yard with his ex-wife. She had led him into the living room first and then, after a strange look about her, had hurried out through the side door into the garden. The yellow roses are beautiful at this time of year, don't you think, she said, waving her hand towards them in the half-light. He came closer to see them, and she moved away from him, her heels biting sharply at the stone walk. We have loads of baby's breath, too. It's lovely in July and August. Jane, said Dan, do you ever write any more? No, she answered. He thought of the dirty old typewriter they both had used and of the table it sat on. Jane would kick the table leg whenever she got to the exciting parts, and that day they sold the furniture to a dealer. The fellow had called the little mahogany thing, mahogany thing, kindling wood, and gave them only 75 cents for it. I saw Chuck the other day, said Dan. He and Helen broke up, you know, and he's living with a little Polish girl down on the waterfront someplace. Oh, said Jane. It was just the same, he went on after a moment, leaning against the fence. The old gang at the table by the window, most of them, a few new ones. We sat and argued and sang at each other nearly all night, just like we used to. Molly's a little fatter, he said, and Joe's gone over to another paper. Sal's written another novel, but they haven't changed much. He crushed out a cigarette and watched her carefully. The phonograph was whining in the corner and we all sat there and sort of shouted over it through the smoke. They played old ones mostly, whispering. Do you like the house? Jane asked him. We've done a lot with it, you know. It was just an old run-down cottage in the first place and we built on and painted. I papered a whole bedroom myself. Do you ever get to New York, Jane? asked Dan, breaking in. No, she hesitated. There's not much time, you know. I have the children and the house, and in the mornings I usually work in the garden. She looked around her. And there's church every Sunday, and prayer meeting Wednesday nights. That's fun, you know. Things go on at school, and there's a missionary society that I'm treasurer of, which means keeping accounts. Lots of things happen all the time. Maybe you wouldn't think so. She turned away from him. Why, tomorrow night, the first grade mothers are giving a bazaar at the Methodist Church, and next week, our Sunday school class is having a big picnic at the amusement park. Suddenly, Jane wasn't talking anymore. The buzz of the evening throbbed in Dan's ears. Oh, it's great fun, you know, she said. And when he turned to look at her, she was crying quietly, leaning against the garden fence with her hands over her face. Hey, you two, called Ned from the other side of the garden, and his footsteps squashed down the walk towards them. Look, honey, I got dressed up for you. <laughs>
I'm not a dirty old farmer anymore. His hair was slicked back now, and a neat blue suit hung on him loosely. Come on, he said, reaching for Jane's hand. Let's go down and take a look at this new colt. He'll make a fine horse someday. In the morning, Dan took his children off for a walk in the woods. Things were better now. He had given them their presents at breakfast, and they had those to talk about. He sat on a stump and let them build tunnels around him. He studied their faces and the way they played and tried to remember himself as a child. Look at the ants, Marge. Should I step on them? Don't you dare, Hugh. It'll rain sure as anything. Once during the morning, after Margaret had taken a fall on the pine needles, she climbed blindly into Dan's lap to be comforted. Dan sat there for some time on the sharp stump, stump with his daughter warm in his arms and thought of many things. On the way home, Hugh suddenly threw his shoulders back and spat wildly for no good reason. I wouldn't do that, said Dan. He would, of course, but it seemed natural to protest. Ned does, said Hugh, firmly and finally, and they walked on. It was decided after some argument that the children might go with them when Ned drove Dan to the station. They were very happy about it and sat waiting patiently in the back seat while Dan said goodbye to Jane. I'm glad you could come down and see the children, she said. I'm glad too, said Dan, looking at Ned. He hesitated a moment. I don't know how long I'll be in New York, but when I come back, or when they're a little older, I'd like to have them on a visit sometime. That would be lovely, said Jan, vaguely. Goodbye, he climbed into the car and waved at her. I'll be seeing you, he called tritely. He wanted to make her meet his eyes, to show him the truth, but she had turned and was going quickly up the front steps. There's something I think I ought to tell you, said Ned, when they were out on the highway with the wind blowing through the windows and the children quarreling casually on the back seat. Do you know that money you send every month for the kids? Well, a couple of years ago, when there was a big corn surplus on the market, I borrowed some of it. He stopped waiting. I'm glad it came in handy, Dan told him. Oh, it's all paid back now, said Dan, said Ned quickly, with interest. It'll be mighty nice to have, he added, when it comes time for us to send these kids to college. Dan took out a cigarette and lit it. Alfalfa, he thought. I'll bet there's alfalfa in that field. Did Jane tell you our news? Ned asked him a little shyly as they drove up to the station a while later. No. It was odd. It hadn't struck him before, but that was it, of course. We're planning a child of our own in the spring, said Ned. He climbed out of the car and beamed with proud eyes at the handful of people on the platform. When Dan was on the train, he put his bag up right away so that he'd have plenty of time to wave at the two little figures standing fondly watching the big wheels and the smoke and the fat engine. But when he looked out, they were already trotting away with Ned. Each of them held one of his hands, and Margaret's mouth was going very fast. As Dan watched them, Hugh suddenly took a few steps ahead and hopped into the car in front of the others. Dan sat back in his seat and looked about him at the other passengers. He saw that their cool eyes were following the little boy and girl and wanted suddenly to tell one or two of them that 
these were his children. Perhaps he could manage it a little later. In the meantime, he bought a package of mints and a New Yorker from the candy butcher and stretched his feet comfortably in front of him. As he spread the magazine out on his lap, he looked down at his knee and, finding a ring of brown sand where Margaret's feet had lain against him, he brushed it carefully clean. And that is The Visit by Andy Logan. I find it very powerful. <laughs> Hope you've enjoyed it, my dears. And that is Tales and Cocktails for tonight. I look forward to seeing you again next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Good night. <laughs>